Hello everyone and welcome to our first session on this bright and beautiful Saturday, warm Saturday morning in Australia, um, Friday evening in the US and all sorts of time zones around the world. So for those of you listening, welcome, thank you for coming. We are here today with Paul, um, he is an educator who has worked extensively around the world, developing um, uh, as, an, as a curriculum expert um, and developing um, our understanding of how we can develop wisdom in children and how that can assist them in their learning. He works with a group of people, uh, he's got his website a little bit later on so we'll, you can check that out as well. Uh, what I would like to do before we get started is thank all of our wonderful sponsors and supporters. So we have Adult Learning Australia and Broadband for Seniors, two wonderful organisations who provide learning opportunities for those people that are no longer in school. Um, the Australia E-Series who are the group of people that bring you this conference and also the Learning Revolution project which is headed up by Steve Hagen and thank you, uh, who provides us this space along with Blackboard Collaborate. Thank you so much. Um, Steve, we really appreciate all of your support. Okay, so just before we get into the presentation, we'd like to see where you're from. So if you're able to just grab one of the little icons on the left hand side and place it on the board where you are in the world. We have a few Australians here and I think we've got, well Paul's in Canada, I do know that, and I think we've got a few others from the US as well, Kathy in North Carolina and I think Peggy here from Arizona. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so Paul, it's over to you. We're really looking forward to hearing your session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Okay, let's begin. <coughs> Wisdom begins in wonder. And we go back as far as Socrates to say, who do we call educated? Uh, those who manage well the circumstances they encourage day by day. Next, those who are decent and honorable in their intercourse with all men. Very easily a good nature what is offensive in others. And being as agreeable and reasonable to their associates as humanly possible to be. And those who are not spoiled by their successes. Do not desert their true selves. But hold their ground steadfast, wise, and sober-minded people. Is that what we have in our system? Let us look at terrorism. Where did we go wrong? People cause terrorism are educated people. They even came to some universities. Uh, Syria, prior to this, had 8 million students in their classes, from K to 12. Where did we go on? What did we miss that all of a sudden ex existence is unrelated to what we teach? Well, let's look at what we're doing right. It was not in listening to the teacher for us to develop knowledge and skills. I mean, we do listen to teachers. I mean, we came out of ancient times with lectures on truths. We, we still have today when we want to tell the kids what's important to know. We got out of the dark ages. Try doing reasonable exercises, developing our reason, becoming reasonable. And we still have that today. We got people to the 20th century by saying, look, I know you know things. I know you're reasonable. But are you competent? Let me give you an assignment to see if you can do it. Let me give you an exam to see if you know what it is I'm trying to teach you. This has got us to the 20th century. But it's not going to get us to the 21st century. So what, what are we missing that should be there but's not there? The 
is the teacher not listening to the student? Has to guide them wisely in existential learning. What do you mean, listen? There's a time to talk. I remember a teacher so well. He came to me. He says, Paul, my kids were wonderful in the morning. I got so much done. In the afternoon, I couldn't do anything with them. And I looked at him and I said, at what point did you think you were God? We need today to listen because in listening, we guide the students to activities that he himself develops his wisdom. We do it through inquiry. We do it through global discussions, group projects, and then portfolio analysis of these three things. But we drew it through listening, not talking. Let me go in more detail. In hindsight, make an inquiries. What went wrong? The daydream and challenge. Inquiry comes from the child, not from the teacher. Because it's the child that says, Maybe there's a better way of doing this. And if he's asking the question, then he's going to look into it. If he's not asking the question, no matter how much we're excited about our own inquiry, the kid says, eh, not my problem. So that's where it all begins. But what's important to know is that the expectation always be greater than reality. This is why in the inquiry, not by me telling them that it won't work, but by him finding more about the actual problem, he comes to term with reality. And he says, oh, and he develops his hindsight, which is the beginning of the wonderment. All that will work, but that won't work. After doing that, in insight, Global education, where did we go right? We went right in global education because we said, look, you don't have the entire picture. But if we share it, if we share our hindsight, what we discovered, we will deal with reality. Because as this picture so well delicate, which I love, the story of the elephant. They have six blind men. One picks the trunk, he's off, and he decides what, what the piece is. Another one takes the tusk, another one an ear, another one a leg, one the stomach, one the tail. In their perception, in their feelings, they feel, I know what this is, but it's only in discussion. Wait a minute, how could you have this about that? Maybe there's something greater that we have to learn than just what we feel. And this is where global education really, really shines. It gives us the other parts of the pieces of the puzzle. And then things get explained to us. So I am a very strong advocate of global education because, and when I say global, you've got to get the kid out of his own veneer. You've got to have them talk to people from a different location. Because how we got out of the flat earth was the fact that we had people who said, I'm sorry, but if we are to come to some reasoning together, we have to take a bigger concept, a bigger idea, and expand our thinking. And that's the beauty of global education. But it doesn't start there with global education. I was pleased when Lucy talked about projects because where do we go right together? When you start knowing what the problem is, you then can work together to sort of solve it. In our schools today, we're still stuck on the idea. You got to do it by yourself. You can't ask somebody else to do it for you. That may be true in developing our homework and doing our exam. But the key aspect of our foresight is to be able to work with other people. 
such that try to do this by yourself. You just can't. But the idea is if you share it with somebody and you put it together, hey, this is possible. So in the wisdom of what I want to achieve is also this wonderful sense of what more could we do if we work together as a team? We break up in groups and try to work together as a team to develop that foresight. Last but not least, I get this so many times. Uh, I'm going to the job. I said, where's your portfolio? What do you mean portfolio? I said, well, what are the things that you have done that you can look back on and say, hey, that was me who did it. When did I have time to do that in school? When did somebody say to me, you know, uh, what, my, what my interest was? When did I have time to talk about my to somebody? When did we work together and achieve something together? If I had that, I could do a portfolio, no problem. Okay. So in other words, we all have a footstep. We all have to look at that once in a while and say, you know, hey, that's my footstep. I'm the blue, blue one. Oh, yeah, I'm the orange one. I'm the green one. That's good because you have to come to know yourself. I call this, my own term, geocide. Because everybody has a different evaluation of themselves. I had an argument with Ed, uh, who did the assessment on, on teachers in, in North America, especially the United States. And I said, Ed, we have to develop a subjective assessment, a portfolio, because we have to counterbalance the objective when we do towards the education of knowledge and exercise skills and homework and assignments. There is a point where the child has to evaluate himself. And that can't be done unless you do the other three. Okay. Now that we know it's important to develop wisdom, how does it actually develop within the grades? For instance, in grade one, two, and three, the news to the kid is going to school starting off, but we should not forget the news of his own world around him. How he describes his global context. And give time to do that. Well, what type of exercises or learning would you use to actually listen to the kid talk about his world? This is what I call the basic one, which is an inclusive aspect that works in every classroom. Basic problem solving, creative problem solving. Okay, identify your world. That's the challenge. Or your goals, or your identity, or your wishes. Okay, I can do that. Do it on a, on a poster, or something like that, a picture. Okay. Now, give me more pictures. Give me more explanations of the world that you're gathering together, because we're going to produce some newspapers of your world. Okay, I think I can do that. Now, in doing that, you're probably going to focus on a problem. Now, it doesn't have to be a negative problem. It could be something that you want to goal, you want to achieve, things like that. But in the clarity of the problem, we have moved from inquiry to class discussion or global discussion. Because the globe to him, a child that age, everything is present and everything is included. And then all of a sudden, in explaining these problems and discussing what problems are problems, you come to the point of saying, idea finding, generate ideas with the group. And then you split off into groups where everyone has to do a newspaper. Do you ever notice that if you pick up a newspaper, Everybody reads a different section of it. Some like the sports. I like the funnies myself. But everybody likes a certain aspect. That's good. That's what they can write about. 
and explain the paper they presented, and then after that, present it to the class. They've just experienced, at the lower grade levels, a existential way of learning. Because now they're talking about the world outside the classroom. And they need wisdom to do that. Okay, that's the lower grades. Let's move up a little bit. Let's get to the middle grades. Describe your changing world. What was the news? Now, usually, I have this spinning, but this won't spin for me. It usually spins because there's a big shift that takes place between grade 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, and 6. And the big shift is they now deal with the past. They don't see the world as pictures anymore, but they see it as comics, cartoons, a sequence of things that are happening. And we, and of course, as we teach at those grade level, explains how things change. But for them, their task is what was news. In other words, what really changed from yesterday to today or a couple of days back or a month away or a year away? What actually changed that to you was, that's interesting. I didn't see that change before. Again, we're getting the kids to talk about their world. And in a way that it means something to them. So they describe the change. Now, to do that, we need a different type of diagram to develop that. And the one I came across was this one. Comparative model. In other words, let's explore change. Now, you'll notice that when you explore change, you don't have an inquiry and a discussion. You have inquiry, discussions, inquiry, discussions. Because in the talking, you say to yourself, well, let me go back and, and ask myself some more questions here. I didn't fully uh, deal with this total change. A lot of questions that did not. Ask. And gradually, through these inquiries and discussions, you come up with, okay, here's the problem I want to talk about in the newspaper of change that these kids are going to do. Now, from that, then you generate ideas, have it established that, okay, these things are changing. What can I change? What can I not change about that? And then you want to write about that. And again, you find yourself saying different ideas from different people and who's going to do what. And again, you divide up into newspaper groups. And then you work together in a project, a group project, where you have to produce that paper. As you prepare to explain it and do it together. Now you can see there's much more involvement of the kids finding out more for himself about the world around him. He's applying a lot of the things that you have taught him in the classroom at those levels. But he's applying them towards a problem, towards a focus, not just scattered aspect. Can you imagine for a minute if, if kids talk globally and we have this structure in place, how much they could compare notes? I mean, it blows me away. But let's go on to the next stage. I'm at junior high now. And I'm saying, describe your future world. What will be the news tomorrow? Now, you can see how they build on, they know the present reality. They know the past, where they describe it. Now, with this basic background, they can now look at, I wonder what tomorrow is going to be. And in doing this, we get this particular model, a project system model. We start from the middle where the star is saying, what's the situation? We go out from there to say, okay, 
how has it changed the past? And then we get to the thing, as, as asked by this person, uh, coach, how do you describe the future? You clarify. Because when you get to the third stage clarification, you suddenly realize the future is hazy. It's not clear. But you begin to talk about how do we clarify that. And part of that is from your, your research, and part of that is from your discussions, and most importantly, the global aspect is fascinating because then you say, well, that may be your future, but it's not mine when you get to the global aspect. What it is that we really want? Then the more people say, yeah, I want that, the more you become clear that's a possible future. I want to be a billionaire, own a house. Well, that's nice, but that's not a clear future when you have these discussions globally and ask those things. So when you have a degree of clarification, you then can move, move over to transformation, which is group type of thing. And partly past discussions, because you have to come up with ideas that are valuable, that could be done. And then you get into working on your future paper as a group. And again, I always stress this, when people are working out their paper through implementation, they're not all going to work on the same thing. Future of sports is different than the future of comics or the future of politics or the future of crafts. It's all different. But yet, they're producing the future among themselves. They're beginning to see what their civilization and what they're going to be doing. And again, if all the schools are doing this, how much more can we share? Because we're all on target, we're all dealing with stuff, and it's not stabbed over. It's actually they want to learn how other people are doing things. And it's so important the teacher guide this as they develop our project system model. Lastly, very important, is the high school. Dynamic world. We went from a system world to a dynamic world. What's the difference? A system world is like a program. You don't expect anybody to think while doing the system. A dynamic world, you kind of expect everyone to think while they're doing it. And to do that, you've got to deal with people. Because people, jokers on the deck, they have their own ideas of what they want to do. So now we have to throw us a paper that's dynamic. And basically, it's based on who you're talking to and how you get your news from people. Now, how do you news? What people and what piece do I do? Well, the key thing here, dynamic creative problem solving. You want to look at the relationships and what they are telling you and have some interest in what they're doing. Uh, the person who created this said it's all about love. Well, I thought that was interesting because um, I remember working with a monthly challenge auto. And this lady, God bless her, she, she had done the whole day everything with this mentally challenged in prison asthma. But at the end of the day, that little girl, not just tall, and this tall adult woman taking care of her, the tall was on the floor and she was trying to pull out her hair. And she was in a panic for us. What did I do wrong, Paul? What, what did I do wrong? I did everything I was told to do. And Ella, I said, did you like her? She says, what's that got to do with it? She knew during the day you really didn't like her. You didn't find anything to like about the person. And as a result, our relationship did not develop. Dynamics requires a love of people and, most importantly, a love of self. Now, if we don't develop uh, portfolios where people are there to say, what do you like about yourself? 
then it's harder for other people to work with people who really don't like themselves. So you build on each other and you build on that dynamics. And all of a sudden, uh, you have peace. Or you achieve peace because that's the wisdom of it all. Now, in conclusion, I want to eliminate tales just like everybody else does. But I'm not here to be only critical of what we are doing right in education. I mean, we have established a really good educational system. But the question is, can we change the system into a dynamic one? And that is, because of through external learning, if students can develop wisdom in the process. Because if they can, we will definitely have a system that's better than the one we have. Now, I'm very glad that we now have time to where it all begins in workshops. And I want to pass the the mic over to the moderator just to have to listen from you because I feel I'm talking about listening and I'm doing all the talking. I'd like now to hear your comments on how workshops can be developed to do this. So I pass the mic on to Beth. Thank, Thank you, you, Paul. That was fascinating. Now, I guess for me, as a, I'm a primary school teacher or an elementary school teacher, I think it's in, mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting um, some of the the points you made, and I'm just going to check back at there was a couple of diagrams for me that really stood out in my context, and I'm just going to switch back to it here. This one, the basic mm -hmm. problem solving um, right. process. Um, when you're teaching small children up mm -hmm. to about the age of ten, mm -hmm. problem solving, particularly I have found over the last fifteen years of my teaching mm -hmm. career, has been a skill that children develop less and less. And now I'm not sure if that's just changing society or whether that is uh, something that's missing from the education system, maybe. But I see this diagram that you have here as a way of um, graphically and simply explaining, well, this is what we do in, in if we need to solve a problem. Sometimes for children, it's, it's difficult to explain to them the steps, but if they've got something like this to go to, for me, I think that would be really useful. Um, now, I know that we've got a couple of people in the audience. Were there any questions that people had of Paul? Either type them into the chapel or the chat I just want to comment on your, can I comment yeah. on your thing? That yeah, this sure. basic problem solving, where it, it's, it is probably successful, is that it doesn't put the emphasis on the child to solve the whole problem. That chances yeah. are you're going to get kids who are going to be quick to identify problems, and they'll, they'll talk a lot in the classroom discussions. Uh, but the more uh, internal people will talk, more catch on in the listening and then working in groups where they, they function much better. And the whole sense of it and the reasons why problem solving falls is because they assume I got to do all the problem myself. And in actual fact, no, what you got to do is contribute to the problem. And that's why you can now support it and guide it through rather than just fall off and say, I can't do it. Go ahead. I'm just... Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I agree with you there. And I, I guess um, the Australian curriculum has changed recently. It's been uh, updated to more 21st century Mm. Uh, expectations and standards. It's it's I quite like it. I mean, there are obviously there's always things that could mm, be done good. better, but Excellent. in my opinion, uh, they're doing a a good job of um, 
encouraging critical creative thinking, um, the whole idea around problem solving. What I think as teachers is difficult is that that is quite a shift from what there was before. So anyone that has been a teacher for a number of years can find it difficult to, to teach these sorts of specific skills. Well, and as 21st century skills, it's really important. Oh, we've got a question there from Coach Carol, but if you'd like to comment, Paul, before I'll we go to Carol. I'll just a quick comment on that. I've been five years working with the Alberta government saying that inspired education won't work. Well, why won't it work? I said, you're trying to instruct kids on how, how to be entrepreneurs, how to be uh, ethical and things like that. I said, you have to look at teachers and say, teachers, in listening to kids, you can teach these skills, but you won't teach it by telling them. And what do you mean? Well, we're so used to the system being titled, get the instructions out, do the lesson plans, give the homework assignment, give the test. Well, you can't fit that in there. It doesn't fit. You have to say, okay, take a breath. And it's very important because I, I deal with emotionally disturbed kids. And five weeks into the school, phone rings. Why? Because the kid says, I can't take any more information. We don't realize how much we talk, but we don't listen. And I better practice what I preach. Shut up. Go ahead, next up. Okay, great. Um, Carol <laughs> had her hand up there. So, Carol, would you like to come to the mic there? Yes, thank you. I'll just put my hand down again. Um, Paul, I was listening with um, great interest to what you were saying, and I like the whole concept of the wisdom model. And I just wanted to go back to this particular slide because this one resonated yeah. for me. Okay. And I, just to put me in the picture, I'm a teacher of adults and have been for many, many years. And mm -hmm. more recently, I've been involved with the Toastmasters Education Program. Okay. And there are so many correlations between what we do in that program with this projected system model that I just wanted to comment. Oh, wonderful. Um, so what we do in the Toastmasters Education Program is we take people through step by step a process where they learn their strengths and as a speaker mm -hmm. and as a leader. Okay. And <clears throat> at one point they can become involved in what we call a high performance leadership project. Mm -hmm. And it's that one in particular that I thought resonated here with this diagram because it involves the person in uh, assessing a, a problem and really coming up with a vision on, on how to solve it and then to create some mission statements that will help transport them to a new understanding of that solving of the issue. And they involve a couple of groups of people along the way and one of yeah. those is a guidance committee and it's with the guidance committee where they start exploring the vision and uh, formulating the challenges and they then also have an action committee or group who will mm -hmm. test out what has been forward planned and implemented and it works so well in so many mm -hmm. different situations. It's a project-based learning environment which has supportive mm -hmm. mechanisms along the way. And I think that is true and has been for some time and that creative leadership, it takes skills to drive that change. And unless people know mm -hmm. how to implement that, and do it in a mm -hmm. co-creation way, uh, it, it becomes probably more difficult. So simplifying it down to a set of steps that people follow in our high performance leadership project is exactly what your projected system model talks about. Exactly. I imagine we could do it with kids. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, there's also a question there, and I apologise if I say your name incorrectly. Um, Chaik uh, Omar has a question there. Sorry for the pronunciation. Oh, lovely. Um, lovely there are question. various ways to gather data. Which do you suggest? That's, his, that's the question. 
So there are various ways to gather data on this. Um, what, what are the best ways you would suggest in, in doing that, Paul? Okay, do you want to get data on this to validate it? Or do you want the kids to get information to validate what they research? So is it from the person researching this type of method, or is it from the actual students doing their research? Which, which one is it, A or B? Um, we'll just wait for a response there in the chat. Yeah, it looks like it. I, I would probably suggest um, it's probably how the teacher or the implementer can get data from um, how they know that they're actually achieving what they're setting out to achieve. I'm making an assumption there, but we'll just see if something else comes up in the chat. Um, you have to realize that your paradigm in instruction is not the same as your paradigm in guiding. Um, okay. If you give a test at the end, it gives you a sense of how much they listen to you. In this type of paradigm, the test is the portfolio of the kids. Uh, from the feedback from the kids, you get a sense as to why they're not, um, you're listening to them. You have impact them because their portfolio grows. Uh, and that's the way you get your, your assessment and information on that. Um, keep in mind that uh, from the very beginning, I say to kids, um, are you in hindsight getting the right information? Because kids grow with information. And, and part of the exercise as they go through the grades is that they say, wait a minute, that information didn't really help me. This information did because it helped me better understand what I'm doing. That's the growth. The very way they look at information, you know their hindsight is developing. If they still go back always to the same source, then you know where the problem is. I hope that answers it a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I haven't, there is, hasn't been a response in the chat, but um, hopefully that answers the question. Coach Carroll, you've got another question. Sure. Uh, yes, you're triggering all sorts of things in my brain this morning, Paul, Excellent. and when you mention portfolios, immediately I was thinking of the e-portfolio movement, which has been happening in the Australian higher education environment now for some years. And I'm not sure if you are aware of it uh, because uh, they're different in each country. But the e-portfolio movement actually encourages students in adult learning circumstances to reflect on their learning and to create their own portfolios in electronic format. And instead of it just being private to them, they can use it to show their tutors that they have understood. So if they've got a project that they have built during some of their learning, they can use their e-portfolio to showcase that project. I, I and because to... it's solely owned by the, the student, then it becomes much more powerful. I, I tend to put a caution on that. And the caution I put on it always is it's important to children to discuss their ideas. It's important for children to work with other people who have different ideas. Because uh, as the um, last episode said when they did the special operation, uh, Charles thought, well, it was all my work. And then when they sat down and realized how many people helped out, they realized it was not all their work. And, and portfolios should include some of that because it's important for the child to realize you're not going to succeed by yourself. There are going to be other people around giving you that support that makes you a success. And even though I, I agree with the sense of portfolio that if you don't show initiative, 
It's like divide them by zero. You're not going to know who you are. So initiative is very important because nobody but you know how much work you're going to put into it. That's very important. But you should have these other three different aspects to consider before you do your portfolio. Yeah, actually, I agree with that, and I, I might not have explained it as carefully as I should have, no. but in the e-portfolio movement, there is a way in which these e-portfolios may be commented on by those people who are guiding or assessing or helping in some form or another, and because mm. of the nature of the e-portfolio tool, it enables all that to happen electronically and it gives a very rich picture of what the student has achieved with the help of those people around them. Have you noticed how much now we are looking at blind assessments? That this is a new thing coming in now where we don't want the picture of the person, we don't want the background of the person or anything, we just want to look at what the person has actually done and say is this good, is this not good? And I'm, I'm very excited about that because um, we, in music across Canada right now, there's more women that assess as musical talent because they did the blind assessment. And, and I think that it's, it's, it's very important that uh, with the digital aspect, and even with this, I'm talking to people, I don't even know your face, and yet I'm enjoying the conversation by what you say, not by what you just look like. And I think that's where we're going to be heading in the future, which is a lot less bias. Anyway, go mm -hmm. ahead. I, I agree with that entirely. Thank you, Paul. I'll hand back to Ness now because I'm going to um, move from this room to the next. And I wish you well. Thank you for joining us today. Pleasure is mine. Uh, thanks, Carol. Um, did any of our other participants have any further questions for Paul before we go on? I'm just waiting to see if there's some questions there. Uh, I'll just take the slides back to here. Um, so Paul, I guess um, in thinking about the idea, and I really love the wisdom begins in wonder idea. Um, as a as a teacher of younger children, uh, I guess I find that it's it's easier to to do that, find that wisdom in wonder, because at a young age, children are still wondering. But as they grow older, probably from eleven year olds onwards. I know it's much difficult, much more difficult to to develop that wonder. Mm -hmm. Do you have any particular advice on on being able to do that, especially once they get into high school? That is wonder. What is that <laughs> in a high school student? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I look at um, women in, in high school, and they, they blow me over how good looking they are and how other people are, and uh, I, I just, it blows me over to meet people and study their biographies and, and discover uh, how wonderful people are. But uh, my, my feeling, uh, I totally agree with you, that it starts in kindergarten and you've got to work it out. And there's so little wisdom taking place in our schools today it doesn't surprise me how discouraged kids get by the time they get to high school. But I think mm. it comes back a step. If I, before I went to high school, had a great discussion with people of what I thought the future was, I know I would have made more friends when I hit high school. If I, before I went to junior high, had a discussion on how things change and, and how they change my neighborhood, such that I'm much more in tune with how things have been altered, I would have been able to have a discussion with junior high. And then if I go back to my elementary and somebody says to me, uh, how do you want to talk about your world outside the classroom? Well, then, then I could talk about change. So one builds on the other.
together, and this is why it's taken me so long to come up with this, because it's just not one thing that you do, like a miracle cure. It's something you have to mm. develop. And my question to all of you is, can we now do workshops on this? And if so, how can we get this started? Because that's where I'm at, and I'm looking for feedback as to how to get these workshops started. And I would welcome any suggestions. Yeah, I, I guess for me, um, Paul, in the way that I I work and how I sort of, in my classroom, um, and even in my school that um, I've been in for the last few years, I think it's about having, it can't just be individuals, it needs to be a whole school approach and it needs to yes. be an agreed way of developing skills and knowledge and understanding around the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and sadly, often that that between schools or even between primary school and high school, that can be lost because I know where I am um, in high schools. They're more concerned about getting through the content that they have to teach than developing any of the social, emotional, or well-being aspects of of students' lives. Even though they are probably the most important things they should be developing in high school students. So I guess. Um, as a school, in a primary school setting anyway, it's much easier to develop a whole school approach to developing such skills. And I know in my last school we were working really um, we were working really hard to develop an approach to student well being, I guess is probably the best way yep. of describing it. And there were aspects of wisdom being brought into that. Yes, sir. But it was also it was also a growing and changing thing as well as as the children began to develop the initial skills that we were trying to to get them to develop. We found that we had to go further. So I, I guess in some some cases, um, yeah, having that whole school approach, I think for me would work best. And that's why I thank you for inviting me because it gives me a a um, a video which I've been working with another college on, to show people saying, look, this is not just for one group. It's we're all in the boat together, and we all can contribute to this. But it's got to be something where we're all, as you say, together on this, because we're starting to develop dynamic thinking. In fact, this is what our world is becoming, a dynamic, mm -hmm. alive world. We don't see the world anymore as a machine, but as a dynamics. And we, we have to uh, take it the next step um, and, and do workshops or do videos or have global education to say, wait a minute, and this is what point I'm trying to make here. Global education will animate your classroom, and here's how you can animate your classroom without taking away from the excellent work that you're presently doing in your classroom. Mm, and and that way now, have far more people coming to a global conference because now it's taking the form of if you want your class to come alive, start thinking globally. Mm. Because without the mm. global, you're, you're still back to the elephant saying, well, it's, it's an ear, you know, can't you tell it's an ear? No, no, it's, it's a tail. It's a trunk. And you're arguing about yourself, saying, well, I know what it is because this is what I do. Yeah, but you're not getting the broader concept here. That it's a mm. whole dynamic that makes learning interesting. It's not just one particular thing that you see. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, that's that's right. And I think every presentation we've had so far has there has been a real emphasis on uh, that that globalness of our world and how we need to connect with with other people because we learn more from those experiences. Um, and I think that that is why having having like even the global education conference that Steve runs in I think it's around November, that is also a brilliant way of connecting with people. This is just a, a different yeah. side of the world that you can connect with, I guess. Um, so we're we're very we're very lucky as educators that we can connect like this um, because yeah. I know when I first started teaching this would not have been possible. How do we get the word out? That's the key. 
that's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, now, um, I've asked if there were any other questions in the chat there, and it doesn't look like there are. So, Paul, do you have any um, closing comments you'd like to, to share with us before we finish up? Uh, I would ask the, the audience to uh, send me ideas about workshops where we can expand okay. on this because it's 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 inclusive approach rather than an excluded approach. And I feel the more we get people involved, we'll reach the tipping point where people say, you know, this is a better way, just like we did with the homework and the testing, just like we did advancement education. We are existential in our learning in the 21st century. Mm. And we have to address it. So I, I look for feedback, I look for support, and I hope uh, we keep in touch and let me know. And Brilliant. Thank you, thank you Paul. Me. No problem. There was one more question there um, for me generally oh, about e-portfolio practices in, in Australia. Uh, in in uh, higher education, so university level education and colleges no. and TAFEs, which mm -hmm. are vocational colleges, um, generally students are expected to keep generally an e-portfolio depending on what they're studying. Um, yes. However, it, it depends on the university's expectations. In general, primary and uh, primary education, and high school education, uh, digital portfolios are becoming more common. However, the digital portfolio is reliant on teacher skill in using technology and also student skill in using technology. So. In That's a nice way of patent, patent yeah. of teachers saying, see, you got that done, you got this done, how many things did you do that? And that is addressed at the university, but not the global university. The global university yeah. says, what problems have you dealt with? Yeah. And, and this, yeah, that's this right. is where we respond to that, rather than to the university, who are more cut up with the instructions and how much I have to teach you more based on what you already know. So we're helping them know where to begin to give an instruction. I'm not against that, but I'm just mm -hmm. saying that if you really want to go to global university, the first question that Albert asked me when I was in Europe, he said, what's the problem? Univers yeah. Global university, yeah. we deal with problems. Well, if kids never deal with creative problems, don't apply because you have no portfolio to show them what problems you're able to do. That's so right. They're, they're never, um, never part of it. Yeah, yeah. So I guess just the collection of an e-portfolio is important in more more important in university or college uh, or sorry, um, vocational tastes and things like that, but not so much in primary school. So hopefully that answers the question. So um, we might start. We might wrap it up there. Um, I've just put in a link for those people who require a certificate of participation. Um, if you'd like to go to our certificates page from the Aussie Live 2016 menu, you're welcome to. So I'd like to finish up by saying a big thank you oh, to fine. Paul. That was a very fascinating session and I'm sure that everyone who is in the room and also will listen later on will gather some interesting information from you about that. Okay. Okay. Thank you again for all your efforts. Thank you. I'll finish the recording now. Okay.